We are live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York City. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Kaylee Lyons. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, Bitcoin can't escape the $30,000 level as tighter policy and tougher regulations weigh on the market. We'll talk strategy with the head of OTC options trading at the crypto exchange, Kraken. And waiting for Gary Gensler, Ken Griffin Citadel is among the firms betting on demand for a future U.S. spot Bitcoin ETF. We'll discuss the regulatory uncertainty with Greg King, CEO of Osprey Funds. Plus, as the crypto winter lingers, we've got a wrap on all the issues plaguing the industry from job cuts and a lawsuit at Gemini to an investigation underway into Binance. All of that is ahead, and all of those headwinds together are weighing on the market. The best way to see a snapshot of it on, on your Bloomberg terminal is CRYP Go. That is your function. But I've selected a few individual uh, tokens here. Bitcoin, of course, has been trading in and around that $30,000 level for some time now, just above or below it, as is the case today. Right now, trading at $29,880, down about 5%. You have Ether down 4%, Solana down 7%. And, of course, Binance Coin, BNB, Matt just mentioned this is in the headlines today the sec probing that initial coin offering all the way back in 2017 when it was just getting off the ground did they break any rules and what does that mean binance coin down about 3.6 percent at the moment matt and what does it mean for all the other thousands of coins that have ico'd um i'm looking at a chart that actually kaylee uh, pointed out shared with me um I think it's truly fascinating. This shows that if you invest during the stock market trading session, this is the white line here, that is, if you buy at the open and sell at the close, you're basically unchanged. But if you buy at the close and sell at the open, that is, you invest when the stock market isn't open, then you've made 268% um, since December of 19. So I think really interesting, once again, showing that if you trade outside of market hours, you do a lot better in crypto. Now, that being said, Bitcoin is back around $30,000, been stuck there for weeks. It briefly breaks above 31 or below 29. But where do we go from here? Financial leaders have weighed in. It has moved up. It has moved down. It goes up and down. Volatility is just a huge part of emerging technologies. Bitcoin is a teenager this year. Keep calm and carry on. We still have the headwinds of regulation and central bank digital currencies, which will be quite negative. We've had a number of pullbacks in crypto since its start, and it has survived each one. A lot of trust has been broken. After we got to 60, I thought we would correct to 30. We got there. That $30,000 level is, seems to be an unbelievably uh, a strong support. We'd be a 30,000, 50,000 range uh, in Bitcoin. If we break below that, we're going to have some ser serious problems. Five years out, if Bitcoin's not at 500,000, I'm wrong on the adoption cycle. Somewhere between 14K, 18K, maybe 22K. We were probably going to hit 8,000. Now, the collapse of Terra, Luna, and the entire ecosystem there has really further undermined confidence in the crypto space. But even though investors were burned, many of them, um, by the failed blockchain, many exchanges are still embracing now Terra's new Luna token. Shanali Basic has the details. Shanali? Yeah, thank you, Matt. We have to talk about Luna 2.0 because it's emerged as a way of compensation for investors around the world who lost billions of dollars in the wake of the Terra meltdown. The new token went live a little over a week ago and it was part of a plan in a community approved proposal by Terra's main backer Do Kwon. The original Terra blockchain is now known as Terra Classic and the new Terra blockchain does not include the UST stablecoin. This token debut got off to a rocky start and among the issues various trading platforms showed differing prices after the tokens were awarded in a process referred to as an airdrop. An airdrop is a way of sending tokens directly to wallets and can be used for various purposes. And while Luna 2.0 has generated plenty of volatility and buzz, it is also generating criticism. We have Jesse Powell, the CEO of crypto exchange Kraken, who took to Twitter to defend his platform's listing of the new Luna 2.0, and he cited client demand as the main justification. Kraken isn't alone. A number of other exchanges have also supported it. And critics are now questioning whether it's appropriate or even ethical, given the collapse of the original Terra ecosystem. All right, Bloomberg, Shanali Basa, great breakdown as always. Thank you so much. Now joining us to discuss this further is Juthika Chow, head of OTC options trading at Kraken. Juthika, great to speak with you. What kind of demand and activity are you seeing around Luna 2.0? 
Well, it's fairly diversified demand, you know, and as Jesse pointed out, um, it is our job to be agnostic. We list uh, tokens in general in response to um, to client demand, which is usually some amount of hedgers and some amount of speculators. And I think the exchange is seeing um, very similar dynamics there. As you guys pointed out, there's no stable coin associated with this one, but we still see stable coin activity on the OTC desk. Um, and so that stable coins in general aren't going anywhere despite um, how some of those played out. But I think in general, the demand is um, fairly representative of our diverse global client base. And that's what we see uh, with all the tokens that we have listed. I want to get down to the bottom of why Bitcoin hasn't broken out of this range. You know, we expected, and as Michael Novogratz um, was saying in, in, in the tape that we just played, um, Bitcoin bounces back and forth between 30,000 and 50,000, but this time it's just hovered down there. And our own David Pan at Bloomberg News wrote a great story over the weekend pointing out that miners have moved a ton of tokens um, onto exchanges, maybe selling, uh, maybe not. What do you think is holding um, Bitcoin in that range? Yeah, so we're seeing the, the kind of both factors, the bullish and the bearish sort of play out at once and oftentimes um, in the matter of just a couple days. So on the bullish side, uh, we are seeing accumulation, you know, as we dip into high 28 Ks, low 29 Ks, there are institutions that are starting to dip their toes again, starting to allocate capital, um, adding to core positions or initiating positions if they were kind of on the sidelines. But at the same time, there's a ton of just um, skittish and uncertainty. There's the macro backdrop. There's the crypto regulatory backdrop. And, you know, I think there's a little bit of, um, of pain from folks who have held uh, longs in crypto and in the broader market down through this sell-off. And so some of them are taking these, uh, you know, five, six, eight percent moves as opportunities to um, to get out a little bit if they were underwater or if they need the liquidity. Um, and so those two dynamics have been playing back and forth over the last couple of weeks in this, uh, you know, two, three K range that we've been in. In terms of the uh, breakdown, you know, retail and institutional what are you seeing and how has it changed over your tenure at Kraken? Well, so on the OTC desk, we're more, more focused on um, on the institutional side, but that encompasses, you know, both kind of the traditional funds as well as high net worth individual um, retail. And so we're still seeing both quite active, but I would say the nature of trading is a little bit different. So in particular, one area on the option side that we're seeing is more yield generating strategies. And I think when you have a bull market, when prices are just going up and um, altcoins are doubling in the course of weeks, um, people aren't as interested in yield generating strategies because because they can just make 100% um, in the course of a month. But in this market, in a sideways market, um, we are seeing institutions and retail come more for call overriding and more traditional yield generating strategies that are maybe not as compelling when there are a lot of easy gains in a bull market. Well, we actually do a survey here at Bloomberg, or our markets live team rather does. It's the MLive Pulse survey. They talked about what assets are at greatest risk because of quantitative tightening. And the number one answer was crypto. How are you seeing kind of volumes changing as we are moving into a, po a policy environment, which is no longer so easy and money is no longer free? Well, you know, I think it kind of works for crypto. Uh, you get the good with the bad. And so now that it trades as a macro asset, um, even though it is it is at risk because cash is king at the end of the day. And when you uh, when people are delevering, sometimes that comes into crypto. At the same time, we're still seeing a healthy amount of activity because it is moving with the broader market. So unlike prior uh, crypto winters or bear markets where crypto was so idiosyncratic and separated and nobody cared about it, um, when you know when price had gone down in yeah. this case we are seeing it move we are seeing it move with fed announcements and with changes to the macro backdrop so um volumes remain strong because of that aspect even though it does remain volatile well people certainly care about it now judica and that definitely includes regulators we actually heard someone from the federal reserve fed governor chris waller uh, speaking last week weighing in on the need for clearer rules in the industry saying quote the main issue in crypto asset regulation isn't how to protect sophisticated crypto investors it's how to protect the rest of us. Juthika, how do you approach protecting your clients at Kraken? 
Uh, well, we take it into account in a whole host of ways um, from the regulatory side through the security side. But I think in general, you know, a lot of things like comments like that are not too different from what the industry cares about. You know, the industry, whether it's the end user or the exchanges, they care about prices that are not susceptible to manipulation. They care about um, security for the end user and custody, um, you know, obviously anti-fraud. So all those things, I think everybody from the exchanges to traders to the regulators, care about and more regulatory um, certainty, I think it's not going to be a bad thing because at the end of the day, everybody knows that regulation is coming and it's the ambiguous and uncertain nature of mm. it that is probably more of the overhang over the markets at the moment. All right. Very cool to get your knowledge on this program, Juthika. Thanks so much for joining us. Juthika Chow there, head of OTC options trading at Kraken. Coming up, Greg King, CEO of crypto investment firm Osprey Funds. We'll probably talk with him a little bit more about regulation and more trouble for the Winklevoss twins. Winklevi, as Matt would say, their company is being sued over their Bitcoin futures contract. To access all the latest data and news on crypto on the Bloomberg terminal, just type CRYP go. We're adding more every day. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Kaylee Lines. And I'm Matt Miller. 2022 has been rough for crypto linked ETFs. Bloomberg data shows the six worst performing non leveraged ETFs this year are all tied to crypto. The $63 million Global X blockchain ETF, the ticker is BKCH, is the biggest loser, down 64% year to date. The other five have all seen declines of at least 55% so far this year. That's as fading speculative fervor and tightening monetary policy especially have really dragged down Bitcoin and slammed the stocks of public companies involved with digital assets. Joining us now is the CEO of crypto investment firm Osprey Funds, Greg King. Greg, thanks so much for coming on the program today. Uh, what do you think needs to change, and I'm, I'm guessing regulation is at least part of the equation, in order to um, bring more stability back to crypto, more confidence in the crypto universe, and get people um, more interested again? Yeah, I think uh, it's great to be here, by the way. I think regulation is obviously a key part of it, but you know we've gotten this far, far with a lot out a lot of regulation or clarity. Um, the uh, by the way, you missed the Russia ETFs. The Russia ETFs have actually done worse. They're down 80 percent. Um, but still, it hasn't been a great year for blockchain. Um, the, you know, the Lummis bill could take a major step forward. I think there's a lot in there that's interesting and that's constructive. Not sure how likely it will be to pass in its existing form, but I think it puts forward a lot of interesting uh, points. And then, of course, you have the uh, the spot Bitcoin narrative that continues with a, an upcoming decision in, in the next uh, few weeks. But clarity from a regulatory perspective is definitely needed. Um, we don't know whether these things are securities or commodities. And that's, I think, the major point for a lot of product pro providers and investment managers. Well, Greg, obviously, you operate the Osprey Bitcoin Trust, OBTC. It's mm -hmm. a lower fee, only 49 basis points, which is about a 75% discount, I believe, yeah. to Grayscale's uh, GBTC. And we know that Grayscale is trying to get that turned into an ETF. It is waiting on the SEC. What do you think the prospects are around that? Well, I mean, they're not the first ones, right? We've had a lot of bites of the apple here, and we've watched this. Uh, for years um, and maintain a dialogue with the SEC. I think a lot of the bogeys that were first identified by Dahlia Blast in her letter in 2018 to the Investment Company Institute have been uh, hurdled. So things like custody, a lot of the issues there have been addressed pretty, uh, I think, completely. The one that remains in my mind is, um, you know, the concern around market manipulation. And the SEC and U.S. regulators really don't have purview into the global trading that happens on crypto generally. We'll just talk about Bitcoin. Uh, but even Bitcoin, uh, you know, is trading 80 percent offshore. And uh, that's a that's an issue for them. So not sure how to address that. I think the industry has proposed different things like linking to U.S. exchange prices only. But the issue is these assets are fungible. And so what happens, say, in Asia over the weekend? Um, will affect global 
crisis. And there's just no two ways about it. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops, especially in the next few weeks. Why do you think it is that there's so much focus on a spot ETF, just another investment vehicle when you have the ability to invest in these coins directly? Why do you need it packaged in an ETF or an ETN a US or ETF an ETP? Specifically, right? Because right. there are obviously yeah. other countries. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it goes down to, it all sort of gets back to um, constraints, right? Uh, portfolio constraints, uh, regulatory constraints, you know, U.S. investors can't necessarily access uh, investments in other countries. Um, and it boils down to uh, fiduciary responsibility in a lot of cases. Um, most uh, people of affluence have a money manager, right? Somebody who's looking over their funds, managing their assets, um, and those folks don't necessarily have a way to port in crypto accounts into their systems, into their kind of process of management. Um, the ETF has historically been a, a very accessible way to get broad-based exposure into traditional portfolios. You know, it acts like a stock. And so I think that the U.S. investing landscape is just accustomed to that tool being present and when it gets a hold of that in the Bitcoin space, I think you're going to see a lot of new inflows. By the way, uh, credit, Greg, to you. I've just looked through ETF Go and found um, three ETFs related to Russia, RUS at FP, RUSU at LN, and uh, CSRU at SW. Of course, they all trade outside the U.S., but they're all down 80 percent or more. So that's absolutely right. Um, what do you think we need to see in terms of uh, regulations across the different um, uh, agencies? D does the SEC need to split things with the CFTC? Does one need to take the lead or the other? Yeah, you know, I'm not an expert on the differences. I would, I would say that, um, you know, the, the SEC and the SEC, um, for a bunch of reasons beyond even crypto, probably need a closer collaboration. I know that's been uh, a move uh, that, that that's been supported uh, by from a bipartisan basis lately, but it still hasn't happened. Uh, I would love to see those agencies integrated over time. I think the U.S. is a bit of an anomaly in the sense that we have so many different regulators. You think about uh, the Fed, the OCC. There's there's more than just even this SEC and CFTC. Um, we would support something that is uh, broad-based and comprehensive in terms of crypto regulation. I think trying to shoehorn it into the existing landscape um, is just problematic. I mean, those of us developing products are working with the uh, 33 Act, the 34 Act, and the 40 Act. Um, and that's as in 19, 33, 34, and 40. <laughs> and so, you know, my math's not great. Actually, it was pretty good. But, uh, you know, it's 82 years since we've got the the 40 Act, and a lot has happened. So I think we need some comprehensive um, overhaul here. I don't know that uh, the crypto is going to facilitate that, but very excited to see a, a bill put forward that is somewhat comprehensive. I know they're proposing the CFTC take control. Uh, to me, that's a political debate, and, and we can steer clear of that. But what our ask would be is that it's, it's a educated and engaged and proactive uh, regulator who's not looking to, to squash economic activity, but to just provide guardrails so that investors and investment mm -hmm. companies can meet with products that make sense that he, the investing public wants. Yeah, we'll see how much of the contents within that bill proposed by Senators Gillibrand and Loomis actually is able to be passed. Thank you so much to Greg King of Osprey Funds. Now coming up, the Winklevoss twins Gemini Trust is being sued over their Bitcoin futures contract. We'll have more next. This is Bloomberg Crypto. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines. Now let's get to some of the crypto stories that caught our collective eye this week. The U.S. Labor Department is being called to task in federal court for its recent strongly worded gu guidance advising 401k plans against crypto investments. The lawsuit filed um, by plan provider For Us All claims the DOL is acting as an armchair financial advisor by issuing sub-regulatory guidance. At least 10 trade organizations representing plan sponsors have been called for guidance to be revoked.
And U.S. regulators are investigating whether crypto exchange Binance broke securities rules. It has to do with the firm's BNB token, which is now the world's fifth largest. The SEC wants to know if the initial coin offering back in 2017 amounted to the sale of a security that should have been registered with the agency. Binance says it won't comment on talks with regulators. And the Winklevoss twins Gemini Trust is being sued by the CFTC. They claim the company made false and misleading statements about how it would prevent manipulation in Bitcoin prices in the bid to launch the first U.S. regulated Bitcoin futures contract. Gemini has vowed to fight the allegations. And that's one of the challenges facing, one of the challenges facing the billionaire twins. Bloomberg's Olga Karif, who's been tracking these stories, joins us now from Portland, Oregon. Of course, Olga, we reported, I think earlier this week or late last week, that they're also cutting 10 percent of their workforce the first time they've um, had big job cuts. Are they uh, facing real problems with the recent drop in the value of Bitcoin? You know, uh, a lot of crypto exchanges and other crypto businesses are uh, facing problems. Uh, of course, Bitcoin is down by more than 50 percent from its all time high in early November. And so, um, you know, trading across exchanges is, is down because uh, a lot of retail investors are staying on the sidelines. So that's prompting job uh, cuts and, and job freezes across the industry. Um, and uh, you know, this CFTC investigation uh, kind of is another uh, headache for for the company. Uh, of course, the Winklevoss twins were, mm. uh, you know, uh, among the first uh, high profile investors into right. uh, crypto and, and tried to push through, you know, some new products, uh, you know, several years ago. And this is kind of uh, stems from that. Yeah, so there's that lawsuit, Olga, 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 but it seems like there are more and more lawsuits happening in crypto. Why? Uh, you know, I think a part of it is that crypto is just uh, has become bigger and more high profile. There are more investors uh, invested in it. Uh, there are more <laughs> scams. There are more opportunities to lose money. And uh, of course, uh, also in recent months, the price of a lot of coins uh, has collapsed and that's uh, led to a uh, collapse in wealth of a lot of the investors. And, uh, you know, that's uh, prompting a lot of these lawsuits as well. All right. Bloomberg's Olga Karif, thank you so much for joining us, Matt. And I love to read all of your coverage on crypto. Of course, you can find that CROIP Go on the terminal as well as elsewhere on the Bloomberg. That's going to wrap it up for Matt and I this week. But coming up next week, we'll talk the rise of crypto in retail trading with Anthony Denier, Webull CEO. That's coming up same time, same place next Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern time right here on Bloomberg.